All right. Well, hey, thanks. Um, you know, I, I, I took a, a look at a list of names here, and I, there's a lot of people uh, that I'd like to thank. You know, I retired three years ago for helping me really put this stuff together. Um, and, and I know that uh, we are able to have, what, 150 people here because it is on Zoom. Um, I think there's what they said, 26 of these. I think I've probably spoken at maybe eight to 10 over the years. Um, I do miss going up to Ukiah, up to Mendocino College. I see Jim Zergonis name on there and I just wanted to uh, give a little shout out to Jim. I, I do miss coming up there and, and, and doing this presentation up there. Um, I am go I, you're basically gonna get two, two talks today. One is gonna be on uh, weed management vineyards and the other one's gonna be in ponds. Um, not a whole lot of new stuff because, you know, like I did retire three and a half years ago, and I am going to try and answer the questions in between the two talks, basically. So, because I can't, if, when I get started, you know, I'm not going to be able to answer the questions uh, when I look down or up in this case. I do want to say, though, um, afterwards, if you have questions for me, uh, I know a lot of you have my contact information. But I think it would be in your best interest to email those questions to Cindy, sorry, Cindy, or to Chris or um, to Monica in Napa uh, to show that there is a need for a new weed scientist in the North Coast. Because um, while I'll still be around and if we do get someone new to help them, I, I think there's a point where um, I'm ready to travel. And um, so this is this is kind of it. Still be around, but I think we need somebody out there to, to maybe get some some new uh, research going. And I know that we have you know a lot of cooperators out there uh, that I worked with that uh, this person would do a fantastic job. So essentials for good IPM. I need to do something right in the middle of my. There we go. For a good IPM program in weeds, when we talk about sustainability, this is pretty much what we're talking about. And it doesn't want to go anywhere. There we go. Know the ecology and dynamics of your crop. Now that is you. That's the uh, the vineyard managers. That's not me. I'm a weed scientist. I really don't know what the crop, or if you're a, a orchardist or a vegetable person, you need to know the dynamics of your crop. I'm going to talk more specifically usually about vineyards because that's what I worked in. So here. You know, I came up with this vineyard uh, uh, calendar just to help me out. You know, when the harvest is, when we get that first leaf drop. Now, I know uh, parts of Lake and Mendocino County, I've been told that the leaves, sometimes they get so cold so fast that they don't really drop, that they stay on the plants. But for the most part, when we get that leaf drop, when we have bud break or bud burst, and then when verasion is um, a little bit of a... a sway in there depending on the year and, and where you are but this is kind of what I use when I when I come up with my theories in, in weed science know your weeds identification and biology this is me right hopefully over the years you've you've seen some of my presentations on identification and biology and I understand now that there are a lot of apps for you to for you to identify weeds but you know the one thing I worry about with these apps is one that sometimes they're crowdsourced. So they, you know, if someone gets it wrong and everyone gets it wrong as you go back and check it. And the other thing I'd like for you to do is check the app on these. Now, I don't know that that app's going to tell you that there's white stem fillery or willow herb or what other grasses in here. So when you do see an adult plant, make sure you go back to another resource, you Google, you know, I would probably prefer a, a, an edition of the Weeds of California to go back and see what the seedlings look like, especially in a weed like this. Now, these apps may be able to identify malva or cheese wheat, um, mallow, because of that very distinctive heart-shaped cotyledon. Now, we all know that uh, a huge cheese wheat plant is really hard to kill with just about anything, right? Maybe a big uh, French plow coming through might be able to get it. But if you can identify them at this stage, you can kill them with pretty much anything. I know that even glyphosate on a big plant like that isn't really effective. 
So being able to get them at a small stage like this uh, really can help. Have a monitoring program and use it. Now, I know I've said this for the, the longest time. Um, you know, you can have a, uh, uh, a program or to monitor, but then those, those uh, sheets go into your filing cabinet. You know, this is, you need to know once you go out and monitor what's going on here. Here we have a problem where we can see that there maybe is some uh, uh, resistance going on. Some of the weeds are alive, some are dead. So what we need to do here is monitor that. And of course, this is ryegrass, resistant to a whole bunch of stuff. You need to know if that is in your vineyard. And here, and I like to show this slide a lot, these are the uh, confirmed herbicide resistance in Italian ryegrass in Northern California. Glyphosate we found in Chico, uh, and Paraquat I think was down in the Central Valley, but glufosinate and fusilade and post were all found in Sonoma County. So it can happen. Uh, make sure you're monitoring and, and know what you have there. Sharp point fluvellin. You know, this is a, a, a weed that is a problem as it's growing and also after it dies. It can hold grape leaves in. It makes any kind of uh, pre-emergent application really hard to do when it gets this thick and it spreads fairly quickly throughout the field. Now, this is, again, not uh, new research, uh, but some that I had um several years ago uh, at the Oakville Research Station in some rows that were uh, 126 feet long every six inches. I took a, a transect marking. Any place you see black is where we found fluvellin. Now the rows are uh, representative of four different replications. So there's about 10 rows between each of these rows. This was my observations in year one. You can see in year two, that the fluvellin has gotten thicker in that first rep and actually moved into the second and, I mean, to the third and fourth reps. By year three, the fluvellin is completely throughout uh, rep one. It's pretty much stayed even in rep two, but it's really started to, to climb in rep threes and rep four. Had I gotten out as a grower that first year and controlled the fluvellin, we probably, probably could have really controlled the spread throughout the other years. So just knowing where you have something, monitor that, use that when you're starting next year's programs. So Cindy, I, I'm at a point where I can't see uh, yes. any of the questions, if someone else has questions. Um, right now, it, it's, it would be in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you click on Q&A, it'll open yeah, up a window. Yeah. I There's no questions see, currently for you. I don't seem to have those. So, uh, oh, there, they're at the top now. I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, boy, my screen's doing all kinds of stuff. Consider all management techniques and determine which is best for you. So this is where I'm going to be for the rest of this first half of the presentation. Control methods. Cultural and mechanical control. So, and I like to tell people, because I get a lot of flack sometimes talking about herbicides, people don't like cultivation. Well, I like to remind people that, you know, every week can be controlled by hand. It's just a matter of time and, and money and it works, right? So there's always that option. I know not for many of us to get out and do some hand hoeing. Undervine cover cropping. I, you know, this, there's been some off and on interest in undervine cover cropping for years, um, one of the uh, another weed scientist and some of there may be some of his students here, uh, Dr. Scott Steinmoss down in uh, at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, was actually the graduate student that we had in about 1988 or nine when we were doing this undervine cover cropping work. So it's been around for quite a while. But it hasn't really been a lot of acceptance. You know, I. I, I I've said in the last few presentations I've done over this month, 
that it seems like uh, the grape industry, especially the wine grape industry, has been a little slow to, um, to really accept new concepts when it comes to, to weed control in vineyards. Now that we kind of have to, I think there's more and more interest. This would be a good time to have a new researcher looking at some of these things. You know, the thing about undermined cover cropping is that if depending on which, which uh, cover crop you're using, you may need to get a mower. And I, and I know in some just surveys I've done and presentations I've done, mowers, not everyone has a mower, not even a slim majority of people have mowers because it is something that has to be done over and over again. There are some complications. You do have to worry about girdling the vines and how like you can see in this picture here on the right, not getting that close to the vines. I'm gonna show this, this data again. This is from that same trial that we looked at with the fluvellin. In this trial where we compared, I compared glyphosate and glyphosate plus pre-emergent versus cultivation. You can see down here in, in the cultivation trial that uh, we have this dry grass. Well, in doing cultivation and not doing any spraying, we found, I found that I, I actually had uh, pushed some of the blandobrome and especially zoro fescue that had been historically planted as a cover crop there in Oakville up under the vines. And then we didn't use any post-emergent herbicide to spray it. So what we had uh, was this undervine cover crop of, of zoro fescue and blandobrome. And you can see that the weed control was fantastic. We still got bindweed, bindweed, no, we did get competition, but bindweed is kind of going to push through no matter where we are. But what I had was this dry duff when I did the um, uh, ratings later in the season. And you can see this is what happens. You know, we get this growing cover crop as the plant grows, and then we get this dry duff that continues to keep weeds out. Now, it's important when you're looking at these kind of grasses that you pick one, as in this picture, that once it's dead or senesced, no matter how much irrigation you give it, it doesn't come back. A grass like annual ryegrass would not be good in this situation because I think as a lot of you know, as long as there is any water, ryegrass will continue to grow. The blandobrome seemed to stay a little bit greener as we irrigated and then finally died, but the zoro fescue, once it had died, um, it was not coming back. And it does, it is an annual reseeding uh, cover crop. So once it's gone to seed, you can you can actually even uh, do some light cultivation or, or just about anything in there. Um, you know, the, the biggest problem with the, the, the advantage we had here was that uh, I did throw the seed in at a high rate. When you're planting this, you're planting it at, at a eight to 10 pounds per acre under the vine acre. So that would be three acres if you're planting just a third of the of the vineyard. Um, and it doesn't look very good for a couple of years. So if you're not willing to give this process three years, because it will actually end up reseeding itself at about 100 pounds per acre, um, then it really is, uh, it's not worth doing unless you're willing to commit for three years. And the, the other thing here, as you can see, this was a fairly low uh, a fertility site. So the grass didn't really grow very high. It can get up to, to 12 or uh, 16 inches. So uh, you may have to mow, but in this case, we didn't have to. Mulching and, and mow and blow. So this is something that we did in Sonoma County. Um, Lucia Varela, uh, Rhonda Smith. We have some pictures of us when we were very young. This is before I came to Napa as a farm advisor. This is when I was still working at UC Davis. Um, what we did here was grow what would be called the, at the time, uh, I think the organic mix, it was uh, vetch and oats uh, in here, let it grow in the middle, mow it, and then throw the mulch under the vines. The weed control, if the vine, if the uh, area under the vines was clean to begin with and not a lot of weeds to keep it from being blown under there, the weed control was fantastic. Um, we did have one little problem, voles. It's the only vineyard in the whole time I've ever worked in vines where we saw voles running between the vines in the middle of the day. The problem with this light cover uh, growing over, uh, being spread over the top of the vines is it's, it was, the voles were able to push easily under it and, and really had just runways back and forth. 
Yeah, sometimes in using other mulches, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, if they're heavy enough, we can't get that same thing. And one of the things that I like to remind people uh, when we talk about mow and blow or even this undervine uh, cover uh, with voles is, you know, when it comes to your, your grapevine, now remember, really the only living part is that under the bark is, you know, where the, the vascular cambium in is and the phloem is, the rest of that huge vine is dead, right? Where the uh, the xylem is, where those the, the water is flowing, just like when you're burning wood uh, in the wintertime, uh, that's dead. So it's really just that little bit that it doesn't take long for these little voles to, to really uh, cause havoc. Mulching, again, this picture at the top middle, you know, when you have something like this, how do you get it into the field? That's always been a problem. We've looked at, over the years, we've looked at other mulches. Uh, the paper mulch here is uh, a mulch we used, uh, again, years ago that had uh, shredded newspapers. For those of you who are young, newspapers are those things that used to come and you get on your porch and read in the daytime, um, in the morning. But there was newspaper in those. This other one, uh, uh, a... Uh, mulching cover that was just the the top of what would go into a five gallon container you know it was a lot of labor um, but you know when you're planting maybe putting them in early you know keeping these things down how big an area do we need to keep clean you know there's just a lot of labor and you know and to be honest for a long time um, we had some pretty simple herbicides that were very effective and very cost effective um, and now that, 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 that we're getting more and more maybe away from herbicides, depending on from the, cust from the consumer or from the state, uh, we're needing to look at maybe some of these other uh, ways of doing weed control. Mechanical cultivation, you know, there, there are uh, ways of doing mechanical uh, cultivation. When I first came to Napa, you know, coming from UC Davis in the, the mid-1980s, you know, we saw a lot of French plowing. Why? Because we saw a little bit less drip irrigation. There was more furrow irrigation, more dry farming, you know, more some even some, well, I guess it would be furrow or flood irrigation. Um, and you didn't need to have, um, uh, you know, the, the roots growing at the top uh, of the vines. And, and again, I like to tell people, it wasn't the weed scientist I did to start using more herbicides under the vines. It was a lot, We the, the viticulturists came to us and said, you know, we, we have more vines grow, more roots growing at the top, but we can't really have deep cultivation anymore. There is one question. I'll take a look real quick. Um, you know, uh, the, there's the question here about do we see any uh, reduction in in vine vigor and growth? Uh, actually, the 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 biggest thing that is important is that we have no growth of the vine. Once we start really into that growing period for, for the vines, it could be, um, you know, I think what's going to have more effect, I mean, I, I don't like the idea of a permanent cover crop, something that, that may come back as long as it dies during the summer. You're probably going to have just as much or more effect from that huge cover crop you're growing in the middle. When I talk about under vine cover, we're only talking about a foot and a half on each side of that vine. So if you're planting, you know, something like, you know, oats or a huge mustard or, or something that's really affecting the vigor, it probably has more effect in that area um, in the in the uh, in the middles as opposed to under the vine row. We're just looking for some cover and weed competition there. But the thing is now, is it back to the to the cultivation equipment? There's all kinds of different kind of cultivation equipment, and this is a picture I took from. Um, my colleague up at uh, Oregon State, Dr. Marcelo Moretti, and I, I've known um, uh, Marcelo since he was a master's student with uh, Neil Soresta down at Fresno State and then was up a PhD student at UC Davis. And when he got to Southern uh, Oregon, uh, the gr grape growers asked him, uh, they wanted to go away from herbicides and could he do some, some studies on this? And there's just uh, so many more different kinds of of cultivation equipment. I think a lot of you uh, in the audience today have used several different kinds of, of cultivation equipment to see where it fits and where it doesn't in, in your operation. Okay. Okay, there we go. So again, then this was a, a, a field day that one of the growers uh, put on in 
in um, in Napa, Patrick Briggs, and it, we, about two days before we were going to do the, the uh, this field day, um, it rained. So we we wanted to see the equipment in, in in action anyway, and you can see here that this did no good. In fact, I'm sure it did some harm uh, to the vineyard. So timing is very important, and I know some of you are are in uh, in in areas where the the soil is not conducive. Maybe uh, you know Southern Napa, or Southern Sonoma County. I I make the joke that I think is funny. I know there's some growers that don't. That you know when you when you're trying to do cultivation in Carneros. You have about a week between when the soil is too wet and when it's too dry to cultivate. And I'm sure some of you, well, it may be an exaggeration, some of you do have soils that are that are like that. If you have weeds like this, the perennial pepperweed, you may not want to be cultivating it to be spreading it more through the vineyard. So it can be a problem depending on which weeds you have and, and what equipment you're using. Let's see if we got... Uh, Yes, and I see the uh, someone wrote that, and I do have that uh, with the the mower. That one you can have uh, some of these equipment that not only can get uh, good weed control, but you can also do some mechanical suckering. Yes. Okay, this thing has to go away for me to. I guess my slides to move. There we go. So the question is here: is you know uh, sometimes you know when we have something like a French plow, it can be pretty hard on the vines. You know, are you going to go through complete cultivation, uh, like up in the uh, the right hand side? You know, the uh, cultivation there it it has its pluses and minuses for sure. And then this in the bottom right hand side, if you're looking at some sort of metal, uh, you know, like a blade or like a uh, sunflower or something with these rocks, it's not good. There are brushes now and other ways to do it that you can go through and still have what would be considered mechanical cultivation. Again. We don't want to get too close to the vine, like the picture on top, or too far away from the vine. You know, I'm hoping with something with more uh, electri elect electronics, electric eyes, we can actually get very closer to the vines without damage. Mowing, and here we have the, the mower that um, I think you were, the question was talking about here, that you can get some good weed control and you can get some mechanical suckering. You know, here's the, the mower here on the other side. Flaming, you know, um, flaming can work. You know, the, the thing that I like to remind people, though, is when you, you are doing flaming, you are not burning the weeds. As much fun as that would be to stand there and burn the weeds and maybe actually hear them scream a little bit. What you're really doing is using that, that gas flame. Imagine it being an electric heater. And what we're doing is we're heating it up. So that with the with the plants, we're denaturing the cell wall or actually boiling the water on the inside of the cell wall and bursting the cell wall. So the plant actually dies from drying out. So the plants, you know, should be have this lush green growth. Uh, it's they should the smaller the better because we're trying to get as much of the plant as we can. Um, and it will be better on broadleaf plants than on grasses. And I stress this a lot because, you know, knowing the biology of the weeds you have. If, if it's grass, the growing point for grass is at or below the soil level, so it'll work like a contact herbicide, and you will be switching your vineyard over to grass being the dominant weed. If you want that or not, that, that's what's going to happen when it comes to flaming. Electric weeders. Again, this is uh, Dr. Moretti up in uh, uh, Oregon State and also Lynn Sosnowski uh, at, at Cornell. Uh, Lynn and, and Marcella were both at Davis at the same time, and now they're working uh, uh, jointly, Marcella, on perennial crops. I think a lot of blueberries and, and uh, uh, hazelnuts, and Lynn in, in vegetable production in, in New York. Sheep. Now, I know there are some people up here that are, are a lot, I mean, uh, uh, have a lot more expertise in using animals uh, in the vineyard than I do, and I know I've, I've, I've used them uh, for this information a lot but you know when it comes to using sheep we go back to this calendar and i know there's going to be some there is some new innovation with sheep you know we like i tell people everything old is new again we've only been using sheep in vineyards for you know a couple thousand years uh but you know the new things we're doing now but right now as a lot of our vineyards are structured there is a period of time where we can get the sheep in after harvest to do some cleanup 
you know, uh, and then we have them before bud break. And that's why it's yellow and white here, because uh, while I know there's been uh, some work in moving the, the trellising up uh, so that the, the, uh, uh, the grapes will actually be higher so that we can have sheep in uh, more year round, uh, at this point, not a lot of vineyards are, are planted to that yet. So uh, when bud break comes, and I know that, you know, Glenn McGordy uh, did a bunch of work saying, you know, using sheep for leafing and how they don't like the taste of green grapes. But I like to tell, I used to raise sheep. It doesn't take 180 pound you very long to wipe out next year's harvest because while they may not like little green grapes, they love little tender buds like this. So the timing is still very important. And, and remember, there's about 150,000 acres of grapes up in the North Coast. And, uh, and we have that small window for sheep. If everybody was using sheep, uh, we'd have to eat a whole lot more lamb. And there are some weeds that you may have, and a bunch of these pictures were taken in Sonoma County, where sheep won't work. This is stinkwort. I think some of you are familiar with stinkwort. This is a picture, I live in Woodland, this is a picture from down the block and there are goats in there and goats are known to maybe to eat more things than sheep do. Well, goats when it comes to stinkwort don't, won't and can't eat stinkwort because of little hairs that are on it and it, it will cause dermatitis if you touch it, but it'll rip the inside of their stomachs up. So they are smart enough to know the only green thing in that field is stinkwort. So depending on which weed you have, you can't use animals. Organic herbicides. This work was done in, in, in Napa uh, by, by Nate Kane. Nate, uh, when he was a graduate student, worked for me for a year. And, and here we see suppress at 9% at 50 gallons per acre of water. Now that's, it's a lot of water and it's a pretty high rate, but it worked, right? The most expensive treatment you make is the one that you have to make again. So I don't know, if you look at the, the, the array of weeds that uh, Nate had here and you see they're lush and green, you may be able to change that rate just a little bit, but just know that you're not gonna be able to skimp and make it work or you're gonna have to go back. So pre-emergent herbicides. So this uh, for me is, is, is pretty important. Like I said, I know up in Lake County, the leaves maybe sometimes just stick to the plants for a lot longer. But when we're using any kind of pre-emergent herbicide, I think, um, or going to make applications, it's important that we have a clean bed by using them. I and you may not need to use them every year, but you can see here, when the grape leaves fall, they get clogged into this, these, these weeds growing here. By having a clean bed, the grape leaves, once the wind comes, they're blown off. So we are clean under the, under the row which makes it easy to make any kind of application. Even if you're making post-emergent applications, you'll be able to hit the weeds. I, I did quite a bit of work. And yeah, I saw Derek, I see you're in today. I'm not talking about the uh, how we, we uh, raked off the leaves and got much better control, but it is important that we do have a clean bed to start with. Another question, I'm almost done with this. Let me see what the other question is. What is the organic herbicide called for that application? That one was that was actually suppress organic herbicide. Um, there are some others, and you, yeah, make sure you check the. Uh, uh, if it's not on the the exempt list, it has to have an EPA registration. And uh, I, I know some of you this kind of hurts, but if it if it takes two weeks to work and it works really really well and it's so sort of hard to believe, recheck the label because it it may not be organic. I have to get rid of this thing again. Else my slides don't work. Okay, so talk about pre-emergent herbicides. So I'm going to use the calendar again. Uh, and, and here, I'm going to talk about, for me, when it's a good time to spray and when it's not a good time to spray. It, there, you can spray after harvest up to bud break, and that's why it's sort of... Uh, hatched at the bud break, depending on when your bud break is. And if you're going to be spraying after harvest and before that first leaf drop, then you're going to have to use a contact herbicide, something like glufosinate or, uh, you know, Rely, Lifeline, or something like Shark or Venue or one of those for, for weed control uh, so we don't get any uh, movement into those leaves that may still have a little green in them and move it down into the plant. 
you're going to be using uh, systemic herbicides, say like glyphosate, you'll have to wait till that first leaf drop uh, up until bud break. If you want to spray after bud break, and this is the restrictions, and I, I really wouldn't mind seeing these restrictions throughout the whole spray period. I think it's just something that we can do a little better job of when it comes to spraying herbicides in, in a vineyard. And then, of course, from veraison through harvest, even if we do have pre-harvest intervals, that we do not spray. And I know a lot of people, not a lot of people spray during that time. Uh, but I just think that once we get, you know, maybe past veraison, in some cases, maybe we can get it back to maybe not spraying at all uh, after bloom, uh, depending on where we are, that you really should have your, your weed control done by that time. And I think most people do. So when I talk about post-emergent herbicides with restrictions, what am I talking about? Well, one of the things that I like people to do is, you know, we get this water sensitive paper you put out to see what kind of coverage you're getting when you're spraying a fungicide or insecticide. So whenever you're spraying your herbicides, put some up uh, above uh, into the cordon or maybe up into the, uh, you know, the leaves once you're, uh, you're spraying and see if you're getting any drift up there. And I've been on this rampage for quite a while, and I know that there are some people who are moving away from it. These brass OC nozzles uh, are the probably least engineered nozzles we have. They're not even made for what we use them for. They're built to it to be turned the other way so that in these huge sprayers uh, in the in the Midwest, and they're not even using these anymore. It was to square off the not square off their spray so it didn't leave one on the edge. And here we are trying to spray them under the vine. Don't use those. I mean, I know still people do. Um, and I, you know, as a farm advisor, I don't like to always say, you know, do this or don't do that. Try not to use these as much as possible. You know, spend a little bit more money on your, on your herbicide sprayers, right? Um, maybe not as much as you're going to be spraying on those, you know, big fancy insecticide or fungicide sprayers, but maybe spray a few, few more dollars. Or I don't know, maybe put a shield spray, a uh, shield on your sprayer. I don't think I've ever seen one of these working in the North Coast. Maybe someone has them, but it sure would be nice to see something like this. So the other thing is changing your nozzles. So when you look at this picture, the, uh, this is a conventional flat fan spray tip at 40 PSI, which is pretty close to what that OC nozzle is doing. If you look here at the bottom, an air induction or a Venturi nozzle, air induction is a T-JIT uh, term at 70 PSI, right? Almost twice as much pressure, there's no drift. You can see the drift out of these. So we can do a better job of putting the herbicide where we wanna put it and not getting it to go up into the, uh, uh, into the canopy and maybe eventually you know, into the product that goes out. A lot of controversy about herbicides being, certain herbicides being in the wine, I don't care what herbicide it is. There really is no reason it should be there if you're, if you're spraying properly. So this, I'm glad this one's coming through. So when you look at these nozzles, um, any of that gray up in that XR nozzle, that is driftable size or very, very small droplets. Next to it is the AI or Venturi nozzle. And you can see those large droplets. And then there are some mixtures here. The AI XR, a little bit of both. You don't have to go to such a high pressure to get a good coverage. You can be at about 40 PSI. And then the one in the corner here is a nozzle from Greenleaf. I have more stuff about T-Jet uh, because it's what I know, but the Greenleaf people and some other uh, spray people are doing some really nice things when it comes to really adjusting the uh, how much drift that we get and reducing that with the nozzles. So we're finishing up here. Um, in, uh, best management practices for weed control in vineyards. And then I'll get to the questions before I go on to the aquatics. Correctly ID weeds to determine best control method. Determine guidelines for when control is, is necessary. I mean, you, you need to decide in your vineyard when you need to go to do weed control. Utilize multiple control methods. You know, I had a, 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 a vineyard manager who I know is, is on the line here today who told me, you know, John, we spray a couple of years and then we cultivate, right? Because you don't want to do the same things over and over because no matter what you're doing, mowing, you're going to, you're going to 
uh, uh, select for certain kind of weeds. You spray the same herbicide over and over, you're going to select for same kind of weeds. You know, disking, you may come up with with more, you know, bindweed, who knows? So make sure you use uh, multiple methods. If herbicides are used, reduce root and uh, residue and offsite movement. Use a vine growth calendar. I mean, I think you do anyway, but kind of look at when you're we're doing things and not just go by days. And finally, if you're, you're spraying, utilize appropriate application technology. Let me get to these questions real quick. Okay, let's see. Is there a specific nozzle I think works best? Um, at this point, probably for what you're doing, an, uh, an AI nozzle, uh, those big nozzles, the, the thing about those, those, they do have little holes in them so that if you get grass or something in it, it really messes up your pattern. Uh, but you need to look into some sort of, of a drift reducing nozzle. Okay. Have I used the off center? Would the pattern not help with getting under the vines? Um, I have used the off center uh, AI nozzles. I know it, they're at an extravagant price of $15. You can go those. You know, the big thing is sometimes I think we can actually. You know, I know we may have to slow down a little bit, but I think we can actually use some of the other nozzles and get just a little closer to the vines. Uh, you may have to drop them a little bit because almost all these vines are, are, are 110 angle, which means they're going to spray a little farther out than you'd like. But I have used the, the, uh, the AI nozzle and, and they work pretty well. You just have to watch because they're set to really get a good pattern. They're set to work at about 70 PSI. Um, if you drop down to 40 or 30, you're going to get kind of a weird pattern. So make sure you calibrate then. Okay, I think, is that it? The, you know, just use some, just look at new nozzles. Use a, an AI nozzle, an AI XR nozzle, something to reduce the drift. That's all I'm saying. So, and I know this is not new technology at all. Those OC nozzles, uh, I had those when I first started it, it in weed science in 1983. So, all right, I'm going to move on. Like I tell people, when I give a presentation, you usually walk away with, oh, with more questions, uh, shoot, more questions than answers. Okay, I'm going to talk about pond and management and weed control. Now, I have you have to remember when it comes to this stuff. I never did any research, right? I was only extension. So, uh, and, and it's really important that you get somebody who knows his pond management. And we, when we are looking for someone maybe to, uh, to take over for me at some point that they know a little bit about aquatic weeds, but that might be asking for too much. Um, I just, um, I went and found out because I know growers had problems with ponds. This thing has to go away. Okay, so um, so there's lots of resources, Aquatic and Repairing Weeds of the West. Now, this is part of the Weeds of California. Joe had this part as part of his book, but it was so big that he sold it separately. The weed control in natural areas in, in Western United States, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there are some really good uh, manuals from other places throughout the country. I'll talk a little bit more about those. One of the things I do want to show you, though, is that ponds are complicated right the ph of the water in your your pond can change from like you know six to ten overnight depending on what's going on as far as rep respiration of the plants in it it really has a lot going on and a lot of times you don't look at your ponds especially if they're raised that just you know you come out and all of a sudden there's weeds in them it's a really complicated situation you know we have algae here um you know, they're, they have these characteristics, they're aquatic, photosynthetic, do not have conducting structures, uh, reproductive structures do not have layers or protective skin around them. So we'll get this kind of stuff when it comes to algae, not really weed, they are different. Um, microscopic or pla planktonic algae, not really algae, actually bacteria. They produce toxins, but poisonings are rare. But when you get a bloom like this, we get fish kill, oxygen depletion, and we can have poison or, or poisonings 
this happens periodically. We see it coming through. Um, not as, you know, it is a problem in, in more natural waters where the dogs and animals are getting to them. We don't see as much in the ponds. We have filamentous algae. Let me see if I can get my, this, that, sorry. It's stuff just in my palm, in my screen. Um, what's in, interesting with this fil filamentous algae is that the growth usually starts on the edges and bottoms of the ponds. So it starts growing down there and then it kind of releases and comes up. All right. Some of the uh, the weeds that are that can be a problem, creeping water primrose. So the interesting thing about this water primrose is that you'll see it growing in your pond. It'll break off and move to the other side and hook in and start to establish again and then break off and move to all uh, all the other parts of the pond. You can see in here, the three species, one native to California, they, they really develop these thick mats and interf interfere with water flow. Your pumps and everything coming out, rooted on the side of the pond or canal, reproduces by seed, creeping stem, and stem fragments. I mean, these things, they, they really can be a problem. You know, one of the things about it, and, and it's really, uh, you need to get someone who really knows uh, aquatics, and they're not easy to find, you know, when, um, and I don't know what the newest uh, herbicides are, but we, we were using, you know, uh, Garlon uh, in, uh, to kill this weed. Now, excuse me, it's very important that you hold the water until the Garlon is gone before you put it in grapes, because I think a lot of you know that grapes really don't like Garlon, and that is not a recommendation. I'm just telling you that's what we used to use. Make sure you get someone, and if you're going to be doing pond applications, I would make sure you got someone who really knew what they were doing because you can screw up a whole vineyard very quickly getting the wrong thing in your pond. I think some of you have seen ponds like this. Azola, when I first got to Napa in 2007, I got more questions about Azola than anything else. Um, it can overnight, it seems like, can take over an entire pond. And it is a fern. It reproduces by spores and stem fragments. It is a desirable native species in a natural habitat. Ducks love it, and you'll see it when it's not, you don't really notice a Zola when you see it in a pond. It's a little red thing hanging around in the in the, the, the cattails and the tulies, but it's when we get this uh, increase in late winter through spring uh, that oftentimes caused by phosphorus because with this uh, symbiotic relationship that, that uh, Pacific uh, mosquito fern has, it's able to produce its own nitrogen. So oftentimes it's limited by the amount of phosphorus. We'll talk about how we can limit phosphorus in a pond, which is probably the most important thing to do when it comes to weed control in a pond. Duckweed, you know, I never saw really much duckweed after the, the, the uh, uh, Azola dies out. We do get some duckweed later growing. I think oftentimes what people call duckweed is usually ends up being Azola. Pond weeds, we have a bunch of different kinds of pond weeds. They're perennials, most with rhizomes. So sago pond, I think this is what a lot of people say when they have grass in their pond. American pond weed, this one's really interesting. You look at a pond, it looks like the tree next to it dropped leaves in it, but this is actually American pond weed. You can see it out here in this big pond. This was up on the western side, up in the hills of Napa. Eurasia water milfoil probably causes the most problems in ponds in uh, all of the North Coast. Uh, this gets in. Uh, this is another one that uh, is, is really tough to kill. It can take over a pond. It's a noxious perennial. Seeds can you know, survive for seven years. This one can really clog up your um, any of your, your pumps yeah, uh, that and, and really cause a problem. Again, herbicide for this one is, is uh, important. You try to keep it from getting to this point, but there's really not a whole lot you can do once it gets to this point besides spray it. Elodia, agaria, and hydrilla. 
So we don't have, if you have hydrilla, uh, call the county, call the state. I don't think we usually have too much hydrilla. There's been some reports over the years. Mostly what we have is uh, agaria, only male plants in the U.S. I think this is still true, has a large flower. And you can see the difference here when we take a, a side view or a, a cut of these. Hydrilla has five or more leaves, Elodea three, uh, Agaria four, but there are some changes. But if you see one with a whole bunch of leaves, you'll know it's Hydrilla, call the state. And, and uh, this is the Agaria here with the large white flower. Algae management. So when I talk about algae management, we're really talking about uh, phosphorus management for the most part. And this, this is, there's some really good books. This is one is from Florida. Um, it, uh, when I took a week long class in Florida on aquatic weeds, it was uh, Lynn Geddes and, and, and Bill Haller. Uh, now it's Stephen Inlow and James Leary. Stephen was a, a graduate student at Davis with Jody Tommaso years ago. He's been in the Southeast for a long time. Really, really good uh, weed scientist James Leary was the one in Hawaii that used to shoot the paintballs at the invasive plants there. So um, you may have to go out of state to, to get some good information. I would suggest stuff from Florida uh, and um, Purdue, and then also from Idaho. Idaho, because of their fishing industry, they really are strict with their what they do with weeds. So to manage algae, nutrient reduction, aeration, bacterial competition, shading, algicides. Talk a little bit about barley straw, uh, not so much biological control and then uh, and biomanipulation. So one of the things is we do get phosphorus into our ponds. But how does that happen? Well, we plant a new vineyard and we put in phosphorus or we get cultivation in the soil that has phosphorus runs down. We get a fire, fire itself with the ash coming in and then maybe new construction. Then we get a heavy rain and it washes into the pond. The other thing we have, when we have geese or ducks, it's amazing how much uh, they can put into the, into the pond. We have here, it, I mean, obviously your pond's not gonna have 6,500 Canadian geese and 4,200 ducks, but you can see that they can actually add uh, quite a bit of, of nutrients. Uh, 27% of all the nitrogen that they had in this lake was, uh, was from the, the waterfowl, 70% of all the phosphorus. So that they, they really can cause a problem. Everyone's probably just doesn't want to move. There we go. So one of the things we have here, buffer strips, right? If you have a natural pond, make sure that there's some place for the turf that can hold on to those nutrients before they go into the water. You know, oftentimes our, our ponds are raised uh, so we don't, we don't have to worry about the, the inputs in, but uh, I've seen them where one side isn't and we can get stuff rolling in. Our algae control with barley straw. If you wanna read these, it's interesting. Uh, barley straw is actually restricted. It cannot, barley cannot be sold. Uh, for the use of commercial algae, algicide in a pond. You can use it as a home remedy, but it's not supposed to be bought or sold for this. Fairly complicated. If you want to know, it seems to work in England, doesn't work here. Right. Maybe, it's the, maybe it's the water. Aeration. Now, this is really important because most people have some kind of aeration in their pond, and a lot of times what I've seen, they're doing it wrong or don't know why they're doing it. Right. The most important thing when it comes to ponds is that in this, especially in this, in the spring transition, when it starts to warm up, the water on the top gets hot first, gets warm first. Once that water on the top gets warm, there is no mixing. Right. So then we get this striation. And you can see here on the bottom level that uh, when you get down into this, this area, you can see the dissolved oxygen goes from what 14 down to zero. So at the bottom of the of the pond, there's there's uh, it becomes anaerobic. The chemical reaction then changes the pH of the water, which then releases the phosphorus that has been dropped to the bottom. It releases it from the bottom, 
then causing a phosphorus that can cause an algae bloom, cause a, an azola or duckweed bloom, and the weeds that are restricted by the amount of phosphorus, then it, the, there's no more restriction. So what needs to happen with that aeration is that you need to move enough water. I'm not an aquatic engineer. I'm sure somebody is. You need to have enough aeration to move that water so that you break up that striation. So you get that water moving around and not just a little something on top that looks cute that is kind of keeping bubbles on the top. So here it is here, right? We need it to get oxygen to deeper water. Some people have put uh, hoses at the bottom of the pond so that the oxygen comes through. That can work too. Again, I've never done the research in, in aquatics, just do the extension. So we need to get really get that water moving. There's some other things you can do, and I'm gonna I'll try to be going through some of these pretty quickly. We used to use alm and other things to combine the, the phosphorus and move it to the bottom. This is Foslock, not an advertisement for Foslock, but just something like this that takes the phosphorus, uh, gloms onto it, and then moves it, locks it into the bottom. Ultrasound, I don't know if anybody uses these, but I saw a presentation and I thought this was really cool. It's just, it's a, uh, it's sound waves. The interesting thing is, is because it's all sound waves going off, that you will get algae growth on the equipment that you're using because it's not going out that way. Um, I've never really seen this in practice. It's just that there's a whole lot of things to do with the pond. And I know a lot of people, they just, they kind of look at their pond and, and, and don't think about it until there's a problem, which is easy to do. Aquatic weed management, just a few management ideas. And again, anything I say is not a recommendation. It's been a while since I worked in aquatics, but just know that you know, there can be some problems and, and that you can to work with. Prevention. So the interesting thing is when it comes to safety on your ponds, you want to have nice shallow edges to get through. When it comes to weed control, you want those as, as straight up and down as possible. So there has to be, you know, a, a compromise between safety and weed control. Uh, prevent nutrient from entering the point sources. If you have a shallow pond, don't let the cattle come up and drink out of the pond and Poop in the pond because there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus there. Use the use the fertilize the the buffer strips. You know, what's fertilize the area adjacent to the pond sparingly. You know, when you're putting in that new vineyard and you're, you actually are putting in some nutrients early on, don't get it let it get into the pond. Prevent livestock and reduce the number of waterfowl. Uh, it's interesting sometimes just by putting a netting around the pond will keep the ducks from getting in. They they don't like it, even though they can land in the water. You can always use a rake. So the cutting and harvesting, the thing about this one, you know, it is organic. The biggest problem here is how do they get into your pond, right? You don't usually build a pond to get a machine like this in. Um, and then it also, the, the fragments can break off. Dredging, you know, keeping the pond, the deeper the pond, you know, oftentimes uh, weeds don't grow much under uh, six feet and getting all that nutrient rich soil out can help. Uh, you can draw down. Now, don't draw down with uh, when it comes to azola. I did have a, a a grower that that decided to to take all the water out of his pond to see if it could control the azola. And I said, well, you know, it's a fern. It's just going to spread more spores. And as soon as you put more water back in, it's going to come back. So knowing that drawdown doesn't always work. The, we'll talk about these other ones. Benthic barriers or just having a cover um, under the uh, uh, under the water on the bottom. Cindy, I'm getting there, I'm almost done. Um, and, um, but make sure you don't get soil on top of it, which I've seen happen before. You know, um, light alteration, talk a little bit about this aqua shade, right? If you, people who have the blue and green ponds, uh, make sure that you keep it at a level that it's doing its job and, and absorbing the light that's coming into the pond. Don't just put it out there and let it kind of deteriorate because it's not going to do its job. It has to stay. Make sure you read the label. Make sure it stays at a level where it's absorbing the, the sunlight. Biological control. Get a lot of questions. You used to get a lot of questions about the Azola weevil. You see it in the ads. They're selling it from England. It's native to California. And it's pretty effective in its natural habitat when there's just a few little Azolas. But when we get this huge uh, breakout of, of uh, Azola, 
uh, the weevil really has no chance. And the funny thing is too, when you read, do a little literature search on the, the weevil, they're not very good swimmers. So they die a lot. Uh, when you're using aquatic herbicides, oh, I did want to say here back real quickly, carp. People ask me about carp, and I don't know if there's a question about carp. Never seen anybody when I was in Napa get a permit to have carp in the North Coast, because apparently we're in a 200-year flood zone, and even though the carp are triploid and sterile, that you'll have to talk to, 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 to fish and wildlife about getting a permit to use them. Uh, and I didn't know anybody who had ever got a permit to use them. But keep asking. Aquatic herbicides, you know, the, they're expensive. And make sure you get someone who knows what they're doing. Don't just spray in there because you really can cause havoc. A couple more slides here real quickly. Um, you can go to the Weed Research and Information Center because everything in there is in the Weed Control and Natural Areas book. Here's, here's talking about Azola, mosquito fern, tells you what to do, cultural controls, and whew, I've done this before. <laughs> All right, let me, Cindy, let me list, so I got a minute and a half, let me look at some of these questions real quick. Right. Um, if some people in animal agriculture and water treatment use bacterial filtration with these, I mean, uh well i that's way beyond my uh my knowledge but i do know that people have put in uh activated some bacteria that take a while and can actually uh, uh break down all the stuff that's on the bottom of your your pond it's not a quick treatment right it's a year after year thing you, and you stick with it and i do know some people that have used it in the, in the mid napa valley they said after a couple of years it worked pretty well but i think reducing the inputs is what's really really important so, John, John, I just want to read out that question all the way for the viewers that are going to watch okay. this afterwards and they don't get to read the question. Sorry, I, yeah. Some people in animal agriculture and water treatment use bacterial filtration with facultative anaerobic bacteria impregnated films to draw the pond water across. Right. So that is what you were just addressing. Yeah. And, and that, that, I mean, that's a lot. Um, you know, I, it, to be honest, uh, if I can get people to do anything with their ponds in the North Coast, that'd be fantastic. So doing something like that, it's like when people ask me about, you know, the, the people that call and ask about resistance, uh, weed resistance in their vineyard, I said, well, the fact that you're calling and asking me knows that I don't worry about you because you're thinking about it, right? It's just the, the problem we have is that, you know, people get busy, they got other things, mildew, all these other things. All of a sudden they go to their pond, it's time to, to start irrigating and the uh, Eurasian water milfoil is taken over. And now what do I do? My, my, my pumps are, uh, are clogged. So anything you can do, uh, it'd be fantastic. Okay, so it looks like we are out of time. Uh, there are a few more questions in um, the Q&A. Um, John, if you have a moment to be able to type in your answer to those questions. The, 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 somebody, well, somebody just really wanted a, a few of the slides. Cindy has my talk and, and, and I, I am going to take just an extra, you know, after all these years, a couple more minutes to say, you know, again, if you have questions, uh, di direct your emails to Cindy or to, to Chris or to Monica. One, because that way they can document how much of a need there is for a weed scientist, right? I mean, the North Coast people, I'm saying this not for my own uh, benefit, but you were very lucky because uh, there weren't a whole lot of 100% weed scientists who worked in one area like this. There was one actually hired six months ago down in the San Joaquin Valley, but I was the last 100% weed scientist hired. So um, I had a great time working with all of you, but it's, you know, it's time for uh, someone else. <laughs>